fans of a Horus Heresy, the serrated sun chapter of the word bearers, and orbital drop battle sarcophagus, thank you very much for joining me for a modelling overview video of three miniatures I've been working on for some time for a heresy army project. And these are the three miniatures in front of us. And we have three of Forge World's resin dreadnought models here to look at today. Firstly, we have the Deradio, or perhaps Deradeo, depending on your inflection, armed with the Volkite, Falconite, and Beres missile system. Secondly, we have the Leviathan Siege Dreadnought, armed with a Cyclonic Melt Lance, a Siege Claw, and a Phosphex Dispenser. And finally, we have this chap here, the Mark IV Ironclad Dreadnought, which I did an unboxing of a little bit of a while ago now. And that is armed with a Flamestorm Cannon, a Siege Claw, and a few other bits and pieces. So I've been building these guys for a bit and all the work is done now they are about to be posted off for a little bit of color and before i sent them off i thought let's have a quick video where i'll just give you a little bit of a tour around each miniature talk about a bit of the modeling and just show you some of the bits and pieces i've done so that's the plan. A bit of background. The Serrated Sons chapter of the Word Bearers. The Word Bearers Legion in 30k Horus Heresy Age of Darkness. They have two unique rites of war, and one of those is called the Last of the Serrated Sun. And the Serrated Sun chapter, of course, is part of the Word Bearers Legion that had a highly pivotal role on the corruption of the Word Bearers to Chaos and the early Horus Heresy. My idea for my Serrated Sun is it is a full drop pod force and everything has to be deployed by drop pod so no kind of like half measures this is full on drop pod assault and that includes their heavy support assets as a thunderhawk transporter is out of production and very expensive to get hold of on the second hand market i decided to go with dreadnoughts for my armored support and that's what i've got here and i've got separately which we're not looking at today three drop pods for these we have a standard dreadnought drop pod to transport leviathan we have a charybdis assault claw for the deradio and we have an Anvilus Dreadclaw for the Castroferum machine and that's how they're going to get onto the table. So yes, there's my preamble. What I'm going to do is we'll go through these one by one and we shall start with the Derodeo. So you two chaps can just take a shuffle and then we'll have a look at the Derodeo. The Derodeo Dreadnought, and this has been in production for, oh gosh, was it 2014 or 2015 this came along? I think probably 2014. Mm -hmm. And since its release, a number of additional weapon systems have been made available by Forge World, and this is armed with the two most recent of those, the Volkite Falconet battery and the Brace anti-air missile system. The Volkite Falconet is interesting. Firstly, I'm a big fan of Volkite weapons. Secondly, I really like how these work in game, and they have the ability to pin enemy infantry, and my, let's say, the gaming meta of my serrated sun force is its pinning capabilities. And these two weapons, feed into that particular part of my strategy and that's why i chose them as well as looking really cool the brace missiles fast firing so you can fire the full rack in one go high strength good ap missiles the actual model absolutely beautiful the radio looks super cool i think inspired by the space crusade chaos dreadnought from many years ago i spent a lot of time carefully working on this pose and i feel it shows off the capability of the kit rather nicely And I've tried to create the impression of a wide, stable firing stance, and perhaps shooting at something slightly elevated, or maybe even in the air, as you can see. And I do love the Forge World kits, just for the ability to put little nuance into poses. And it's things like just slightly off-centering the arms, slightly off-centering the head, the position of the legs, all these things can bring a dreadnought to life and it stops it looking like a static rigid machine and makes it, in my mind, it evokes an impression of just how, despite these being massive, great walkers, they are actually surprisingly agile and mobile. The missile system, the Boreas, very nicely detailed. Like the design thinking on these, with these missiles, I imagine they could be perhaps have some sort of ramjet system so like the meteor missile currently for example be deployed by the raf or about to be deployed by the raf on its eurofighter typhoons 
and I've magnetized this missile rack as well, like so. And the reason I've done that is at some point, I'm hoping the fabled and mythical Atomantic Havis will be released, at which point I'd like that as an alternate weapon system on this. And it, that will also synergize well with other parts of the force, i.e. the Cataphracti Terminators. I really like the Volkite Falconets. I think they're really cool. Board out the barrels on these two heavy bolters on the waist position or the torso position. And base-wise, these are all going to be painted with Isfan 5 base style. And with this guy, I decided to go for, he stood on level ground with just some scattered boulders. But I also added a couple of bits of battlefield debris. Here we have a badly damaged studded pauldron. It's been ripped in half. Part of it's been ripped away. It's been bent out of shape. And it's been punctured by a number of projectiles as well. So certainly a appears the remains of a, well, whichever Astarte is was the owner of that and didn't have a happy ending. And then on the rear of the base, I've taken a plastic Mark IV helmet from the Trail at Kalf set and just cut out the, let's see if I can get a focus here. This might be hard. There you go. I've cut out the neck. And it's not damaged, but it's just a discarded helmet lying on the ground. So there you go, there is the Deradio Dreadnought. We'll pop that chappy over there. And now we'll move to the other heavy Dreadnought chassis in this trio. And this is the Leviathan. So Leviathan Dreadnought has been around for a few years now as well. I think that was a 2015 release. This one, I think I bought this last year when the last Dreadnought weapon arm often was on. Yeah, and a great miniature to pose. I put it in a position as if it's, I don't know, it's stalking forward, it's crossing rubble and ruined terrain, but it's also in a stance that indicates it's seen a threat and it's getting ready to move against it. So there's like an anticipation of movement in this stance. That's what I've tried to do. Very poseable model, despite its huge bulk. Weapon-wise, because this is coming down in a drop pod, I've gone for the Cyclonic Melter Lance. I think it's a very effective choice for this Dreadnought in that configuration. The weapons are magnetized in case I want more in the future. Very chunky signature design. I've also included the Siege Claw with an inbuilt melt gun. I just feel that feeds into the kind of cutty, slicing nature of this force. All my despoiler tactical marines that are in this are armed with blades as opposed to chainsaws. And I've just got this edged weapon thing going on. I've also attached the Phosphex dispenser or Phosphex launcher on the carapace. Again, a great weapon for a closing assault dreadnought. And it then has its secondary torso battery as well. Here we have twinned Volkite Colivers. But I thought, well, why not? Let's magnetize these. Because, well, I suppose because I can. And while I think the Volkite Clivers are the optimum choice on this Dreadnought, I think there might be some situations where heavy flamers could also work. So those are magnetized, so I can swap those around. But I'm going to put the Volkites on because I like the Volkites. If I could remember which goes on which side there again. Cool. Yeah, so there is Leviathan Dreadnought. Base, as it said, we've got a couple of bits of ruined masonry, some piles of rubble, and then this which could be, you know, maybe some dirt, dust or whatever. Yeah. Such a great model, this. So chunky. The siege claw is also magnetized. And with that. I've mounted the power cable as so. So I've left it detached here, like that. And that works all right, I think. One other nice little modeling touch with this guy is on the power cables for this melter lance. With the cable here, I imagine that's in quite a rigid position, that, and there isn't much flex left in that cable. 
However, for these, I decided rather than having them sticking out perpendicular to the weapon, I would give them basically some droop effect as if they were under the influence of gravity. And you can see how I've done that. And again, it's little touches like this. So when you're modeling dreadnoughts and titans as well, night titans in particular with forge world, you can take advantage of the flexibility and heat bendability, if that is in a term, of the resin medium to create these interesting and rather neat looking effects, I believe. There is the Leviathan Siege Dreadnought. So you can now go guard that corner of our field of view. And then we'll move on to the final and certainly rarest model of this group. And this is the Mark IV Ironclad Dreadnought from Fordwell. It'd be great if they brought this back in, it really would. It is such a lovely model. I'd not bought one before. Having modeled and built this, I think this is an absolutely brilliant model and I'm very impressed by it. And it certainly takes the old Castroferrum design and turns it into something really cool. There's quite a bit going on here. So in terms of general modeling and posing, you can see how it's got its foot rested on this pile of books. And of course, the word bearers, well, they have this theme about destroying false knowledge or knowledge they don't agree with. This is a heresy era. And I'm not quite sure how the complete works of Kirill Sinderman ended up on Fields of Istvan V, but they have. And this dreadnought is about to burn them and it's got its foot rested on them in a symbolic indication of the word bearers' purpose and power. So yeah, some resin books I got from some dungeon range, which I've modeled into that random pile. Really good posability. The torso is on a tilt. I've used the ability to tilt the head, again, to add to the sense of motion in this model. These Mark IV Dreadnoughts, they don't have as much posability. They don't have fully posable legs like the Leviathan and the Radio do. So you've got to use other approaches to get motion into them. And that's one of the approaches I've done here. This miniature's got all sorts of fascinating details to it. It has a pair of frag assault launchers, a smoke dispenser, and a rack of two hunter killer missiles on its upper torso. In addition to that, I bought the claw, again sticking with my theme of the bladed weapons for this army, which came with a storm bolt, a secondary weapon. Because this is going to be a drop pod assault, Dreadnought, it needs to be armed to deal with anything. So I've actually gone for a melter gun. And what I did is I took the mounting bracket from the Storm Bolter, cut the Storm Bolter away, took a melter gun from the Mark IV plastic set and basically modified it. The ammunition cylinder or the I don't know, fuel reservoir was actually mounted on the other side of the melter gun. So I cut that off and swapped it round so it was on the right side for this Dreadnought. I then bought the barrel out of it. And I'm really pleased with how this came out. I really, really like the look of that. Those of you who saw my original review will remember that the arm on this close combat weapon was cast in fine cast for some bizarre reason. In spite of that, though, I managed to make it look reasonable. Um, although fine cast should never be used. <laughs> Get rid of fine cast. Yeah, it's not my favorite, but a lovely model. Really, really nice model, There's so much detail going on. And, as I said, surprisingly poseable. I mean, it's difficult to pick a favourite out of these three because I spent a lot of time working on them and getting them right. There is something about the pose on this one that I perhaps could put it as the first among equals in this force. So there you go, three word bearers of Dreadnoughts for the My Serrated Sun chapter force. A couple of final things. One of the characteristic looks of the word bearers is their use of, or their application of prayer papers to their war machines and armor. And these three Dreadnoughts are no exception. And I've taken thin slivers of resin, I have say from shims, and crafted them into prayer papers that have then been attached to various parts of the dreadnoughts and I've done like a, a mark where they've been nailed in place or well, perhaps applied in place and you can see there's a number of smaller prayer scrolls on this and I did all sorts of things to rough some of them up and make them look a bit ragged as if they've been in battle and perhaps maybe worn as well but you know and in amongst all the worn ones here is a pristine one it's nice to kind of 
just use these little things to add character, these little visual modeling touches to add character to the miniatures. There you go, three really interesting and fascinating Dreadnought miniatures for an equally interesting and fascinating Horus Heresy army. I'll be saying goodbye to these in a couple of days' time when they go off to the painter, and I will undoubtedly do a follow-up video once they return. So what do you think about modeling Dreadnoughts in the Horus Heresy? How do you go about doing them? Do you have any particular approach to building them and your own ideas around customizing those builds and making them look individual and interesting? And how, as well, do you use your miniature to tell a story? And as you've gathered from all three of these, there is a story going on with each one, as well as being a cool miniature. I would be interested to hear your thoughts and observations on that and these miniatures in general. But other than that, I'd just like to say thank you very much for watching. I'll speak to you next time and goodbye.